is certainly important for forming community. Community is so very difficult to form since our society is based on competition. Everybody for himself, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, and everybody else is a possible enemy. But in the platoon or in the unit, your life depends on the others, and their life depends on you. When a man sacrifices his life, dies for another man, is for the other. That's the important part that you might call common to all love, the other. I think it's possible to look forward to moments in history when war will be so obviously ludicrous and destructive that we will choose other ways of resolving our conflict. But as long as human beings vie for precious resources, or live in the context in which they have to defend their own existence, we will discover that the will to live in the face of threat to our well-being will eventuate into hostility, and usually hostility reaches out for whatever power is available to achieve its end. So yes, war is going to be around all the time, but I'm looking for pockets of peace. Many believe that the ideal of a loving God is the pole star that can guide our way. Although history demonstrates that religion is often a provocation to war, religious belief can also provide a path to opening the heart. In San Diego, two men are working hard against the odds to encourage the flow of forgiveness in their community. All the people you're going to meet up on stage today have been deeply affected by violence. Hey, I wanted you guys to take a second and look at this picture right here, okay? Because I don't think that this is something that we see very often in our world. This man's grandson killed this man's son. And they're sitting here together today in the spirit of forgiveness. Tarek Kamisa was shot and killed when Kamisa refused to give up the pizza he was delivering to a phony address. Tony Hicks admitted to pulling the trigger on 20-year-old college student Tariq Kamisa. He said he was angry. He'd been born to teenage parents who were gang members themselves. When I got that news, I felt pain like a nuclear bomb had detonated inside of my heart. My son... He died six weeks before his 21st birthday. It's the most excruciating pain a parent can ever feel. I can't believe a 14-year-old to handle a gun and take a life of a, another human being, an innocent, unarmed human being, for a lousy pizza. that on that date you did in fact shoot and kill Mr. Kamisa during the attempted commission of a robbery. Is that correct? Yes. It was one of the worst shocks that I've had in my life. It's one of the last photos I took of him before this tragic incident took place. He was 14. I experienced all the emotions that could be experienced by a caregiver whose grandchild does something like that. Name it. Shame, guilt, sadness, anger, disappointment. 
because I was really powerless. I couldn't do anything to prevent Tony from making a violent choice to commit murder. On January 21st, 1995, I shot and killed to recommission a person I didn't even know and who didn't do anything wrong to me. I still don't know why I shot to read, but I don't want to use my problems as an excuse for my actions. I'm sorry for the pain that I caused. I pray to God every day that Mr. Kamisha will forgive me for what I've done. I'd lost a lot of will to live. I became very suicidal at that point, I thought, and I could quite have easily have ended my life. My uh, upbringing is Sufi Muslim. According to the Sufi teachings, good compassionate deeds are spiritual currency, and they transfer to the departed soul and provide high octane fuel for the soul's journey. My faith had given me a mission. I had a job to do. I had to get up every morning and create spiritual currency for my son. Through that prism of the soul, I was able to create forgiveness and love. And I saw that there were victims at both ends of the gun. And one thing I've learned is that when you stay in resentment, you are totally transmitting. You're not receiving. There's no room for love and joy. I knew that there wasn't going to be very much sympathy for this black teenage kid who committed murder in the context of a gang involvement. He was the first kid to be adjudicated as an adult, and it would result in Tony being sent to an adult prison as a teenager for 25 years or more of his life. Teenager. For 25 years or more of his life. From the first time that I found out that Tony was responsible, I really wanted to meet Tarek's family and to express my sympathies and condolences to them. I met Plas. And I looked into his eyes and said, Plus, I want you to know that I don't feel any animosity towards you or your, or Tony. I feel that this tragic incident victimized and traumatized both our families. And I've started this foundation in memory of my son to help me deal with this loss in a positive manner. He said, um... I'm going to form a foundation in my son's name, and uh, I'd like it to be focused in preventing violence. I don't know what I'm going to do or how I'm going to do it, but will you help me? And I said, yes, of course I'll help you. I'll do anything I can. This tale ends where most tales begin. <laughs> Tony has murdered somebody. He knows he's done the worst thing he could ever do. He knows he's made the worst choice he could have ever made in his life. But it's too late. Sometimes we don't realize how painful it is unless it happens to us. How many would want revenge here? Many, huh? It is natural to want revenge. But let me ask you, would revenge bring Tariq back? Yeah. Instead of revenge, I chose forgiveness, and I reached out to Tony's grandfather, Bless Felix. And that was 10 years ago. And because of forgiveness, there's a lot of love I have for Plez. There's a lot of love that Plez has for me. I have a friend for life that would do anything for me as I would do for him. Hello, brother. How are you doing? Good, Plez. How are you doing? Good, good. Good to see you. Nice to see you, too. 
Welcome back. We've been together working together for 10 years now, and that seems like the elder brother I never had. Are you doing good? Yeah. This well, relationship that we're in contributes to the healing. And as long as we continue to do this work in the way we do it, the friendship will continue to grow and flourish. The unity and the brotherhood and the bond that has come out of this tragedy is something that blows my mind. That my love for Plez has grown. I have been able to contain so much more of the Divine Spirit, so much more compassion, so much more understanding, and so much more joy. When we think about the ancient racial hatreds in certain parts of the world, in all of the ethnic conflicts that we have witnessed in recent years, uh, we see how difficult it is for people to let go of the past and start over. And yet I think that's what we're challenged to do. Just as those of us who have had personal experiences of loss and disappointment, we have to be willing to put that to rest before we can love again, before we can find a sense of renewal. I think the same is true in the world. If Pless and Azim are the story of uncommon friendship, ordinary friendship is the essential element that all loves have in common. Jesus said, uh, greater love hath no man than this, that he gives his life for his friends. And friendship, Aristotle noticed, was a purer form of love than romantic love. It's purely there for the other. It doesn't seek to fulfill anything in itself. It seeks to give. And over time, as you get older, friendship becomes, I think, more and more important. Camilla Williams, leading soprano of the New York City Opera Company. Little David, play on your harp. Hallelujah, hallelujah, little David, play on your harp. Hallelujah, little David, play on your harp. Hallelujah, hallelujah, little David, play on your harp. Hallelujah. Mama said, you can count your friends on one hand and have some fingers left. That is the truest statement that was ever made. And this is a good example. What's with your thumb, Boris? It hurts? No, yeah, a little bit, uh -huh. you know, the arthritis is <laughs> creeping <laughs> gradually. <laughs> I was born in Sofia, Bulgaria. In 52 days, I am going to be 95. <laughs> He's counting the day. <laughs> I'm 85, and when I met Boris, I think I must have been 27, 27. years old. <laughs> I'm the first Negro to receive a steady contract with a major opera company, New York City Opera. I had just finished my debut in Madame Butterfly, and they had arranged a big concert tour of 50 concerts. I had a call from Columbia artists telling me that Dr. Bazella was coming to have an audition with me to see whether I liked him or not. She opened the score. It was the... Uh, married to Figaro. Mm -hmm. I strike a chord on the piano and she starts singing. I could not believe my ears. A voice from heaven.